Thank you for the nice introduction, and uh, it's great to be here with all of you. Thanks for being here, and uh, good afternoon. John, welcome to Wharton. You're great to be here, uh, given all your busy uh, schedules and things you have going on to, to spend time with our students to help them understand the business of sports and baseball in particular. Um, so that was John's sort of baseball bio that's in the program. And let me tell you, let me fill in some blanks for you. Uh, first of all, John, I'm not going to say anything bad. John is a native Philadelphian uh, and went to uh, the Haverford School here, Amherst College, went straight into business school at the other place. Um, he subsequently ran a very successful hotel company and then a business that grew from about eight or nine million dollars in 1985 to $3 billion uh, about 20 years later. So that's the background he has that he brings to the Philadelphia Phillies. Um, the other thing you should know about John is he was a collegiate wrestler and wrestled against Olympians. And so I think in a sense, if you think about having that sort of experience as an athlete, he at least can relate to some of the issues that professional baseball players and coaches face. And finally, he and Lee have three grandchildren, which tells you that he can manage people and patience. So, <laughs> so John, thanks for being with us. And let me start with a really obvious question that I think all of us would love to know, and that is, how did you get involved with the Phillies? So um, my, my father... <laughs> Kind of retired around 1992, uh, kind of retired a little before that, <clears throat> but he kind of walk into my office constantly and say, well, I need you to do this, and I need Clint to do this, and I need Will to do this. And I say, Dad, you know, we're busy. We've got meetings here. We're doing that. He says, well, I need to talk to you. And I finally said to him after about a couple of years, which was around, he had been doing this for a while, so it was like around 1992, I, I said, Dad, I said, you got to stop. You're killing me and you're killing us. And I said, he said, well, I don't know what to do. And I said, I need to buy you something that you can enjoy, but not have to work at 40, even 80 hours a week, just relax. He says, do you have anything in mind? I said, I think we should buy a sports team. And he goes, well, that's kind of nice. Most people buy like a car or something. <laughs> so I said, if we can buy a sports team, you don't have to run it, you love sports, so we, we just kind of looked around. We, we kicked some tires, actually got in some deep negotiations on, on a football team. Um, but ultimately, my father said, I want to buy the Phillies. We had the opportunity to buy into it. So I bought into it. And I said, here's, here's your thing, Dad. You go do it. And, and, and good luck. And <laughs> leave me alone. Yeah, leave, leave all of us alone. So, so that's what we did. That's how I got into it. But you grew up as a fan from yeah, five. Yeah, I was five, five years old. Yeah, my first game was five. My first Eagles game was six, so I've been a Philadelphia sports fan for way too long now, 65, <laughs> 65 years. That's awful. Good for you. So uh, here's something that uh, a lot of us who follow sports but really probably don't really understand, given the way it's reported in the media of what owners do, and sometimes owners seem really unpredictable, but what do owners really care about? Do they care about winning? Do they care about making money? Do they care about, what, what are the metrics of success? You came from business where it was stock value, it was profitability, employee satisfaction, cust what do you care about as an owner? So you're talking baseball, or you're talking about all 122 plus? You pick, you make it easy on yourself. Well, I can't really talk for anybody about myself. So um, to me, it's really black and white. The only thing that matters is winning. Nobody, nobody gives a to hoots whether we make any money or not. Uh, you don't, you know, there's no trophy at the end of the year for the most regular season wins per dollar of payroll spent. So you either win the big trophy or you don't. And if you don't, you, if, you wanna, if you're the other team that won the small trophy for the pennant, that's nice, but you still haven't won. There's one winner and 29 losers, and that's really what it boils down to. And so you win, and you could, doesn't, nothing else matters. You just win. So, John, if you think about all the owners you know across different sports, but probably, primarily baseball, how many owners feel that way, that the, the only metric of success is winning the big trophy? I don't know. Um, a lot? A few? It's the minority that is that black and white. Yeah. So the other thing that, uh, this is the Wharton School, so we think about finance. So one of the things that's interesting is you're seeing more and more types of owners come into franchises, right. whether it's private equity, sovereign wealth, uh, non-local families, et cetera. 
from your observation, we don't have that issue here. Everybody here is committed to the Phillies, et cetera, here. What, does that, what would that tend to do to owners' behaviors, given that sort of diverse investor pool that may not quite care as much, may not, maybe they do, about winning the local trophy? So, um, you know, baseball doesn't allow sovereign wealth funds in. Um, I'm hearing that football's kicking the tires on that. I don't know if they've ever agreed to allow that to happen. We were the first league to allow uh, private equity funds in, but they're limited. Um, no private equity fund can uh, own more than 15% of a team. No aggregate of private equity firms can own more than 30% of a team, and no private equity fund can have more than 25% of its assets tied up with a team or teams. So, you know, I think for a lot of people, it's a um, welcome s source of finance. Um, we looked at them, we talked to several people. Um, you know, the problem, there's a couple problems. First of all, they all have to have exit strategies, right? Uh, the second is they're all looking for returns because part of the return of owning a sports franchise is, frankly, being a fan and, and attending games and, you know, meeting players and, and attending postseason games. And if you're, you know, an investor in a PE fund that's invested in the Phillies, you don't get any of that. Um, and there's very strict rules, too, about information flow uh, to protect the confidentiality because of the reporting requirements that PE firms have. <clears throat> so you don't even really kind of get the inside baseball stuff because you're not allowed to share it. And so um, we looked, you know, here, and it's, here's a good example. I mean, their, their exit strategy and their ability to, to get their returns is all tied to buying under market. And if they can buy under market and sell five, ten years later at market, they've, they kind of make the return. And we looked at them and they said, well, we think you're like worth X. And we said, well, we don't think you're even close. And we actually, like six months later, sold it for like 25% more than they were willing to pay us. So that's a pretty steep discount. And I, I, just, I, don't, I won't deal with them anymore just because I, I kind of know the game they play. And, I'm not going to give away, you know, even 20% or 15% of the team um, on, on that basis. But look, for, for a lot of people, you know, we're, we're lucky. Philadelphia's a big place. There's some wealthy people here, big, you know, fans. So our pool of investors, local investors, is much better than, than the average team, way better. And if you have a less than average opportunity, then you take what you can get. So one of the things that's interesting is let's, let's assume – that we're all owners in a team, we want to win the World Series trophy. What kind of financial guardrails would you suggest to us to set? <laughs> Do you want to sign Juan Soto? Are we out of time? Yeah. <laughs> at some level, there are no financial. I mean, look at the Otani deal. Yeah. I mean, what's the, what's the financial guardrail around a $700 million contract? Although the present value is really only 460 because 70% yeah, of it's paid, paid off in 10 to 20 years. Yeah, this, I mean, you know, it's, look, it's, it's a problem. I mean, no, no if, if, if you're a small market team, it's a problem. I mean, you, you think, yeah, you yeah, think yeah. about it. I mean, what, what chance do you have to sign? If you have a really great player who's coming up and you've developed him, you know, you're looking in six years, he's, that player is a free agent. Yep. And, and even before that, you get into arbitration, you know, the pay really escalates quickly. You know, it's, it's, it's hard. And you wind up trading them. I mean, Tampa's done a really good job of staying competitive, but that's they the exception. Can't sign them. Yeah. They they trade them off, and they they try to bring in young talent, and they've done it really well for a long time. But that's really hard to do, and they're really the only team I could think. Milwaukee's also done a very good job of that, but you know, it's you struggle with that. We're going to come back to that. How you know the whole Moneyball thing was? How can a small market team compete with? Right the big market teams and, and what are the, what are the le levers those smaller teams, uh, smaller market teams do? What, um, what are the biggest mistakes that you've seen owners make? You can include or exclude yourself, but what, what kind of mistakes, and maybe it's new owners because they don't know any better or maybe it's just dumb owners if there's such a thing, but what kind of mistakes do you see? <laughs> no dumb owners. No, no, well, no. I, I, was, I was just kidding sure. about that. Yeah. Um, so I, I think the, 
Look, I, I should, I don't know that I'd say it's, it's a mistake, Oscar. It's a mistake if you don't recognize it. And, oh my God, sorry, that was supposed to be. I just called you. Actually, I was no, gonna no, tell no, you what. It's, 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 it's MLB. <laughs> I'll, I'll take it. Yeah, what no, do you want to tell him? Yeah, yeah, yeah don't. <laughs> He's busy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, sorry, I thought I'd turn that off. Um, I'm sorry, where was, where was I? I was going back to. Um, Oh, what was the question? Yeah. What do, what do uh, owners, what kind of mistakes yeah, so do you see owners make? Keep, such, keep talking, it's, it's don't mind such me. such a different business. If, when you first come into the business, um, a lot of what you learned and, and done and needed to do to be, to be great and successful outside of the sporting industry doesn't apply. And, and you have to be smart enough to realize that, disciplined enough to, to kind of um, not jump in too deeply and, and too in too much detail, and then and, and then the hard but the hard part is, you know, knowing because because <laughs> do you have something for me? Hell no! I thought you were going to wear stuff. <laughs> you told me I had to be respectable. <laughs> I was kidding. I didn't think no. you'd believe me. Yeah. So, so like you want to use this? No thanks. Our, <laughs> You know, every industry has what I'll call technical knowledge that's kind of particular to that industry, and you have to learn it and master it in order to be an effective CEO. But the problem is, in sports, you know, your business is a team. And, and so in baseball, you've got to know how to evaluate baseball players, how to develop baseball players, how to manage baseball players. And there's nothing you do out in the outside world that teaches you how to any of that, so those skill sets. So it's also hard if, you, if you've never done them and you've never managed people who do them, you know, you come in and, and you can get buffaloed easily yep. because everything, everybody sounds intelligent and, and turns out that some of the people who sound intelligent really aren't. And, and, and also you make a lot of mistakes. I mean, you look at the number of, you look at the percentage of even first round draft picks who actually even ever make Major League Baseball. Forget about being an everyday player, forget about being a star. And it's 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 a crapshoot, and and so it's really easy to to kind of go down a wrong path early on, and then you learn, and 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 you need you know what I did, and it's frankly what Steve Cohn did in the Mets. We just hired great GMs, and said, okay, I mean, we're smart enough to understand we don't know that, but you do, and and you let them you let them do their jobs, but it's hard to find that great GM. John, I remember when you first were taking over this role where you're really fully in charge, not in the background. And that was the thing you said is that I don't know baseball. I've got to find somebody who can do it because if I start to get involved, it's going to be a disaster. How do you find a great, what are the two or three questions that, is it just luck? No, Finding it's, not, it's, what? no it's, not, it's not luck, but the, look, so, but the problem is, I mean, if you think about your career, and I was telling you about mine, I, look, I started working in our factory at 16 years old. I did every job there was. I, I was a, even all, I was a salesman. I, you know, so I knew what it took to be a good salesman. I knew what it took to, to work on a particular line. I knew what it took to be. I was a foreman. You know, I, so I knew what it took to be a foreman. I knew how to manage those people. So when I interviewed people, like to, for a VP of marketing, I knew the questions to ask, and I knew the, more importantly, I knew the right answers. Yep, yep. You talk to a GM. And you don't you don't know anything. You've never managed a general manager. You've never done the job. It's hard. I mean, that's my point. You can get buffaloed. And so, the, you know, to me, the best predictor, unlike the financial disclaimers, the best predictor of future success is past success. You know, and I bet heavily on Dave Dombrowski because, you know, he he was really he's, he was great, and then he was great before he got here. So we actually teach that in class that. When you're picking leaders, look at their, what they've done in the past. That's the best indicator. No, I think it's really true. Um, let's talk about, again, this is business school, revenue streams, uh, media re broadcast revenues, contracts, stadium, real estate development, which is sort of something I can passably talk about. Um, how do you think about these the various revenue streams, spectator, ticket sales, Merchandise sales, how does that factor into the World Series goal? Well, obviously the more, I mean, simple, the more money you are bringing in, the more money you can spend. Yep. The more money you can spend, assuming you do it intelligently, 
you're buying better players. I mean, you know, if you sign a, if you need to pay thirty million dollars for a player, it doesn't always work. But usually, the thirty million dollar player is better than the ten million dollar player. You know, so it's not. And the, but the ten million dollar player can have a great postseason, and the thirty million dollar player can, you know, not have a, a successful postseason. So there's a lot of variability. But you know, so what's unusual? Unusual. What's different about baseball than the other major sports is the degree to which our revenues are local revenues as opposed to national revenues. So most of the, the significant, well, I think it's like two thirds, 60% of NFL revenues, NFL teams revenues are generated by the central office, uh, lar largely the huge television contracts. But you know, baseball started in the 1800s when they didn't have things like radio and television and so you owned a team, I owned a team, we played each other, I played in your stadium, that was, the, you were selling your tickets to your fans and you kept that revenue and when I sold my tickets, I kept that revenue and then we started selling hot dogs and you kept your hot dog revenue and I kept mine and, and, and the value of the teams were really driven by the revenue so local revenues determine the values, they determine how much the next buyer, the next owner paid and, and it kind of just aggregated. And then there was radio, and then there was TV, but they were all local revenues. And the, the problem the problem that baseball has is the disparity between the large market and, and the small market teams is significant. Um, and you, you get, so I think putting aside the individual best interest of a team, I think the long term for baseball, I think we need to move more money into the the central baseball fund and then have it distributed equally among the 30 teams because that's the only way the small market teams are really going to be able to, to remain competitive long term. How do you think about real estate? All you read about is different franchises uh, building new arenas here locally. We had the right. 76ers, uh, you had the Cleveland Browns. I mean, you have all these different teams talking about building mixed use. We're talking about here in South Philadelphia. Right. Sports complex. So, is this just sort of a real estate typically is big money? Is that a big opportunity for sports teams to raise a lot of capital to deploy into winning the Super Bowl, the World Series, et cetera? Well, well I, think, so I think the answer is yes. I think one of the attractions to it, particularly to baseball, is if you can structure it legally so it's outside what baseball has called centrally generated, I mean, sorry, locally defined revenue. So it's not subject to the luxury tax and the revenue sharing. And so as a result of that, people will, people will look at that. But no, Oscar, I mean, the, the project in, in the sports complex is, is really great and, and it's gonna, and it's gonna, I think it's gonna be really successful and transformative for Philadelphia. But it's, it's still a sidelight. I mean, you know, you're still running a ball club and that's gotta be your focus. So, um, you know, I'm excited about that, but I'm, you know, I'm not going to get rich off of that. I mean, I think I think what we're going to do is, is it's going to incrementally help the value of the team because it's you're going to create a, a kind of more things to do down when you're down there. So people will tend to go down there earlier, spend money maybe in restaurants, stay later, spend money in, in bars or something like that, and be more inclined. Maybe they'll go to ten games a year rather than five because it's a really great experience. But you know, it's, you're still, it's you don't want to lose sight of the, the the product, which is a baseball team. Well, and I, and I know for for our case in Philadelphia, we're lucky to have owners who really are Philadelphia citizens and want to make a community a benefit to the community to the South Philadelphia area. So that's a, that's another thing for us fans to appreciate. You know, um, one of the fastest growing new majors we have at Wharton is analytics. Uh, I think it was started three or four years ago, and now in the MBA class, it's 10 to 15 percent of the students get that major right off the bat. Wow. Uh, yeah, it's, it's unbelievable. And so usually when you talk to the non-sports people, everybody knows what Moneyball is. Everybody saw the movie, Brad Pitt, et cetera. So if you think about Billy Bean, the Oakland A's, the movie, as an owner, and you were one of the first ones, I remember when you hand, hired Andy Galley from uh, Google, Yep. Um, kind of pretty early on. Um, Actually, we were late. But pretty early on compared to some of the other guys, right? No, you were late? You were last? I don't know that we were last, but we, you know, 
In 2013, we spent literally not a nickel on analytics. That is late. Yeah. And, and in 14, I was trying to help you out. Yeah, no. no I, and in 14, we spent $100,000 only because I kept you know, saying, you got to do something here, guys. And they, and they hired a very smart guy out of the labor relations group up in New York and out of Major League Baseball. And I was like, guys, this is an analytics department, not a labor department. <laughs> But, and he was good, but you know, he really, we eventually he left and we hired Andy, and Andy was you know, really good. What, as an owner, how do you see analytics going forward? How important, unimportant is it to you to getting that World Series trophy? So I, I, think, um, I think Dave and I have the same mindset. I think as much information as you can get on these players the bet, you know, it's, it's good, and it's, and what you're really looking for is, is congruency. You're looking for agreement between the scouts and their eyes and the analytical people and, and, and their formulas and algorithms and, and their conclusions. And, w and when you see that, you know, agreement, you, you know, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, you, you feel good. And when you don't, when you see a disparity, then you need to explore kind of the why and, and so forth. And what and what's good is, and it's, it's our group gets along really well, and they're, and they're integrated. So we have analytics people who focus on scouting, and other analytics. You know, the free, you know, the, the rule four guys who are like the college guys and high school guys, and then we have you know analytics people who are embedded in the pro scouting. We have analytics people who are embedded in the, the player development side, and so they're really working. I mean, their desks are sometimes like right next to each other, so they're working together all the time. Is there a magic metric? Are there metrics that you really like that are predictive? Um, there's not a magic metric such as there's like a single one, Oscar. I mean, there's, when you get into like the draft and you sit in these, these conversations, there's you know, at least half a dozen that are commonly, you know, really used all the time. And there's probably another half a dozen or, or more that are used periodically and stuff, but you know, you have them, but you don't tend to rely on them as much. But you'll see people like kind of reach into one of those lesser used ones and say, well, you ought to really look at this number because this is like really, this is really great, a great number. And it's just, it kind of jumps out at you. And so yeah, that's kind of the, our guys have been really good. So the last couple of years, like, like this guy, Jeff Hoffman, who has been a tremendous bullpen guy for us, he was an analytics fight. I mean, our guys said, you know, you ought to, you know, to the scouts, you need to go look at this guy because he's really, he, his analytic numbers are really good. You need to tell us whether something's there. And they came back and said, he's really good. And, and so we, we got him and he's been, he was sent fantastic for two years. It's, uh, it's interesting. In terms of, in the earlier panel, we talked about um, how the, uh, initial foray into analytics was using data that was already there and, and rethinking about what it meant. And now we're very much in a wave where there's just new data being created, whether it's visual data, biomechanical data. And, and, and I know that you guys spend a lot of money and time figuring out what data sets to purchase, to, which you can then run through your, your algorithms and things. Is, we don't even really purchase stuff. It's ours. So like the, the, every stadium has like 10 of 12 of these Hawkeye cameras. Every single player's movement on every single pitch is recorded. And you can, so you can track whether the left fielder is, what kind of a path he's taken to and how efficient the path is to, to take to the fly ball. And by the way, what's the center fielder doing? And, and, and the amount of data coming out now, Asuka, is just, it's like Niagara Falls. I mean, it's just every game is like 10,000 and then, the tr and the trick is, and what's really becoming important is, is the guys like Ani Akalami, who's our uh, the assistant G GM in charge of analytics, is getting, how, how do you, I, and there's a guy named Alex. I can't remember his last name. He's I've a, heard of this guy. I hear he's really good. He's got a great dad. He do, does he? Yeah, 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 yeah. I know him. Actually, I heard his mother's a lot nicer. Well, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> but, um, the trick for them is to take all this data and somehow make sense of it, yeah. you know, put it together in, in, in useful information so that people like Sam Fold can kind of act. Wharton MBA. War, not yet. He's well, in, he's in Wharton. 
Yeah. We'll get them through somehow. Yeah, somehow. <laughs> so, but, but that's, yeah, it's, 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 it's important now. It's going to stay important because there's just, there's just too much at stake. You have to, if people who don't look at it, I, I will tell you, if you look at the Phillies after kind of that 2007, 2011 period, so if you, we looked at, uh, Andy McPhail looked at the, tw the 10 year period from 95 to 205. We had the high, and then you looked at every single draft pick of every single team for those, for those 10 years, 10, 11 years. We had the highest collective war of any team in baseball. Wow. You look at the next 10 years, 205 to 215, and, and we, we just kind of when analytics became big and we had nothing, we went from first to dead last. And we were so f far dead last that the 29th worst team was like twice as good as we were. I mean, you couldn't even see them. Uh, we were that's that breathtaking. But that's, that's the impact of analytics, and we didn't have that. And, that's, and, and so analytics is just gonna stay. I mean, scouting is gonna stay there too. Um, so we're running out of time before we go to the Q&A, but let me, let me uh, I have got two or three questions I wanna slip in here before we open it up. One is um, pitch clock. There's all sorts of things that are coming up to make the spectator experience better. Right. Uh, I know that you guys have to really sort of vet them. Um, what's, what's the general idea on the pitch clock? How did it come to pass? And then what other things are coming down the pike that you think might be good ideas? So the pitch clock came about because baseball did a really good job on, on a consumer market study and, and got in you know, thousands and thousands of, of responses. And people were complaining about the length of the game. And the game was averaging like 305. Of course, now you have no time to get a hot dog. Yeah, well, you, you miss like three innings. You, yeah, you got, you got more time than that. But, but uh, so we looked at it and we said, we got to solve the problem. And the only way you could solve the problem was the pitch clock. Yeah, speed and it, up. it took a while to convince the players. And even when we implemented it, some players liked it. So, but we, we, we tried it in the minor leagues for years before we did it, Try, you know, tried to bring it into the major leagues. And actually, there were major league players who were on rehab assignments in the minor leagues who would come back and say, you know, I played, I played for like three weeks with this thing. It's really not that bad. And others would say, it's great. So we got some positive, but the bulk of the major league players didn't really like it. Um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of things now that are being tested down there. I think automatic balls and strikes is being tested. I think it's some form of it's coming sooner rather than later. Makes total sense, doesn't it? Yeah. Unless you're an up. <laughs> no, but, you know, look, these guys, the problem, the, these guys don't want to be shown up. I mean, they, they, they want to do a good job. They want the game to be called properly. They don't want their missed calls to determine the outcome of a game. And I think, I think the automatic balls is... So, and this was the same thing with instant replay. You know, they actually welcomed it because they were getting tired of, like, people getting on them about missing a call. And, and, you know, with YouTube and things like that, I mean, you can go on YouTube and say, you know, give me the 10 worst calls in, in the 2024 season, and they don't want to see their name up there, yep. you know? And so I think that's going to be the same thing. I think you'll see that. There's one thing that I, I really personally I'm intrigued about, and that's um, the batter t running to first base on a passed ball. So, so just like a, a runner on base can, can advance if there's a pass ball, mm -hmm. There, there's talk about letting the, the batter do that. Oh, and I oh, think that oh. would be tremendous. I really do. I don't know, you know, I don't know how you, once you leave the batter's box, what the rule would be about getting back safely, you know, if you decide you can't do it. But it's just, I think it would be really a hoot. I, something like the, uh, the, bin, the, bin, the banana, the banana, the banana, the banana, bananas, something like that they would do. <laughs> I like that. All right, so if one of our students wants to go to work in Major League Baseball, work for the Phillies, advice, what kind of advice would you give them? Um, so I, so I, I think as a Wharton grad, I think you got a real leg up because I just, I mean, you guys are smart and you're way smarter than the average person. And um, I think that's on the business side, you got all, you got all kinds of opportunities wherever you want. You can be on the marketing side, you can, you can be, on the sales side, you can you know you can you can be on the financial side, and you, and you can apply to teams. I mean that's what Dave Dombrowski did. He literally wrote to every team in Major League Baseball, and he got like, one person who wanted to interview him, so he went to work for him. 
Um, make going to Major League Baseball is a good way because a lot of a lot of teams will pick people out of Major League Baseball who've been working up in New York for you know three or four or five years. Um, but you got to remember, it, you know, the product's a baseball team, and you make you know the raw ingredient are athletes who play baseball exceptionally well. You got you got to if you really want to be in the business long term, you got to get into that side of the field, and 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 learn something about it. You, you know, you just can't be ignorant. So, um, elephant in the room to me is, we didn't win the World Series. Right. Second most wins in Major League Baseball. We didn't even get the little trophy. No. It was reported that you were angry, depressed, mad, frustrated. I didn't even bother to call you to say, hey, it was still a great year because I knew you'd get mad at me. Yeah. Um, so. What's your current mindset? You've had some time to cool down. You've talked to Dave. You've, you've obviously started making some changes. A great announcement today, some changes in the front office, which I think is exciting. Great for Sam, great for our Sam. Um, and I know that your favorite baseball saying is, John, don't worry, it's just baseball. Yeah. Yeah. So can you comment on your, <laughs> Lee's laughing. Can you, current, can, you, can you talk about your current mindset and how you look at that? What's the role of luck anyway? And, what do you think we can do different to win the World Series next year? So, so in December of 2005, the second day Pat Gillick was on the job, I had lunch with Pat and uh, Dave Montgomery. And um, after we kind of went through the chit chat, Pat looked at me and he said, you got questions? And I said, sure do. Second question was, what's it take to win the World Series? And Pat's answer was luck. And I said, okay, Pat. I said, I get You're fired? No, no, no. no, no. I said, I get luck. I get luck in my personal life. I get luck in my business life. I understand the role that luck can play. I said, tell me how luck plays, you know, the, what, the role that it plays and why you say it's, all, it's luck in baseball. He said, John, he said, great organizations consistently put really good teams on the field. They compete for the postseason on a regular basis. They often, if not usually, get in. But he said the difference between getting into the postseason and winning the World Series is luck. Because to win the World Series, it takes 25 guys who are healthy and playing well at precisely the right moment in time. <clears throat> and he said, and if you look at any season and you stop it at a different point in time, middle of May, early August, whatever, he said a different team would win the World Series probably than the one that ultimately does. You know, that's true this year. If you stop the season in the end of June, we would have trounced everybody in the World Series because we were just playing lights out. Yep. You know, and we didn't, we didn't at the end. Now, I think you can do things to shift the odds in your favor. Um, you know, signing Juan Soto. Might, might signed, change the odds. Whoever signs them, their odds just get better. Um, but you know you can, so you can go. Th you know, I think you can. We, we just got to get. We got to. Oh, let me go back. I think the secret to anybody being really good is being able to be objective about your strengths and your weaknesses. You got to be able to look at yourself in the mirror. Self awareness. And 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 look at your organization and be really really analytical and I and, and in a in an objective way. And then you have to figure out whether the, your weakness is, how do you solve them? Can you make this person better, or do you have to move them out and bring somebody else in? And, and that's the same process in looking at the baseball team. And you look at you know, this, you know, what players are really good, and, where, you know, and what, play, who, what players are coming up from the minor leagues, and who can we get in a trade, and who can we get in free agency. And, and you have to just pursue those. And, and you just can't be, you know, the, the, that's baseball is such an excuse in my mind for not thinking and not really working hard uh, and not trying to tilt the odds in your favor. It's because, look, I mean, there are, there, are, there are World Series heroes who are just nondescript players who just get hot for a week and they're, they hit four home runs in five games or something like that and hit 650 or something. But, you know, you, you got to try to tilt those odds. You, you know that's going to happen. That's the luck part. But I think you just... And you got to have the best players you can get, and you have to pursue that. And I think that, you know, going back, you said you asked me about the metrics. You just, it, it's, you, you got to want to win. 
and that's at the end of the day, that's all you can do is, is just keep pushing. And you, I push everybody, and Dave pushes everybody, and you know we'll, we'll see what happens. It's gonna be an interesting all season. So one of our professors is famous for talking about grit, grit yeah. Angela Duckworth, and and one thing that I thought you had said a while back that I thought was fascinating, and it pertains to all of us, and that is. Once you're successful, everybody in this room is successful, you're a Wharton, that's a huge achievement. If you think you've got there, and that's kind of what you are, you're toast. Yeah. <laughs> so, the quite, but the, it's different, as you described, if you're a professional ball player, there's actually a huge downside to change to get better. Right. So, downside your, risk, huge so, risk. so your pep talk, yours and Dave's pep talk, among other things, is players, you may be outstanding, but you gotta change. Is that, is that a fair, I mean, how do you think about that? Well, I, to me, it's just, it's just part of going back to what I said. You have to be coldly objective about yourself and your strengths and your weaknesses. And, you know, you, you just, you, if, if you have a weakness, whatever that is, you've you got to address it. And, and there are things you can do to address it in, in baseball. It's hard. Nothing harder in the world athletically to do than hit a baseball. But you can still do something. I was with Chase Utley all morning, and we were talking about this, and you know, and he said, you know, John, and he reminded me, as Mike Schmidt does, that it's a little harder at the plate than it is sitting back in the stands, but, but he said, you know, you have to know how to bunt. You have to know how to choke up on a two-strike two pitch and hit the ball to make contact to the right side to move players over, to move players in. He said, you don't necessarily have to do that all the time, but there will come a point in time in, in games and certainly in a, many times in the season and a lot in the postseason where you, you got to do that. So you have to have the skill set. You have to, you can't just say, well, I'm just a, I'm just a slugger. Um, I've never seen a better drag bunner than Mike Schmidt in my life. I mean, there hasn't been one. But Mike Schmidt wasn't paid and he's not in the Hall of Fame because of drag bunting. But Mike Schmidt could hit a drag bunt down the third baseline as well as anybody I've ever seen in baseball. And he did it periodically. When he needed to get on base to lead off an inning, when he needed to move a guy over from first to second or second to third, he could put that ball in that let, let line like nobody I've ever seen. And Should we? So should you have to do it. You know, it's like, it's like being able to hit your seven iron or your pitching wedge. You uh -huh. know, uh -huh. you, know you, you gotta be able to do it. You know? <laughs> John, thanks. So let's open it up. Uh, terrific stuff. Uh, so questions, we have some microphones on the sides. Let's go to the gentleman in the third row here. Thank you. First, I want to say thank you again for coming. Uh, I'm a student here. It's a very cool opportunity to be able to speak with you. Um, I was just interested in, you know, recently you sold steak in the Phillies to a couple other billionaires uh, for the financial health of the Phillies. And I was reading up on it, but I'm really curious about the thought process behind that, uh, what goes into big decisions like that, and who you include. So, um, you know, in COVID, we lost over two years, like about a little over $200 million. So it kind of started there. Um, we put, you know, some money in, but then, I don't know, my, my, my desire to get my trophy back has caused me to spend a lot of money on, in payroll. So we're still losing money mm -hmm. after COVID. Um, we have a lot of work we want to do. We've got a um, Dave Dombrowski laid out a, a vision for our clear water facilities um, and it's like a $350 million project um, and then we've got a lot of money to spend up in uh, Citizens Bank Park. It's 20 years old. Some of that's, you know, kind of infrastructure upgrades, improvements. Some of it's, you know, fans enjoy games differently. They, they, they engage with games differently than they did 25 years ago. So we need to, you know, we've been doing things, but we need to do more things to kind of adapt the stadium to, to fans. And so all of those things added up and we looked at, I mean, our, frankly, our tab was like three quarters of a billion dollars. And we just said, you know, you know well, my wife said, you're not spending $750 million, John, on the Phillies. So I said, okay, honey. <laughs> Enough's enough. <laughs> yeah, as I said, so tell me what I can spend. <laughs> so we just felt we needed to go to the outside. We needed to like broaden our, our financial base, add some depth so we can do some of these things, um, you know, comfortably. 
Great. Any other questions? I've got one that I'm burning to ask, but I'll wait. Let me ask this question. Oh, there's one up there, I guess, right. Hi there, uh, my name's Logan. I'm a recent graduate from Davidson College. Um, I'm a big White Sox fan, and they're really bad um, at running an organization. He wants you to buy the White Sox. <laughs> yeah, no, that's my pitch. Um, but uh, I, you said that the Phillies were late to, to, to analytics. Is there anything else that you feel like you don't want to be late to when you look around the league, whether that's within Major League Baseball or even other sports uh, like Premier League, um, anything, whether that's fan experience related or just how to build the organization up? I'm just curious. Um, so um, the fastest growing expense category in Major League Baseball over the last five plus years isn't payroll, it's a player payroll. It's actually ancillary uh, services. So like the analytics departments and all that. I mean, it's just massive. And then the amount of money you're spending on equipment, you know, cameras, all kinds of special deals. There's a million dollar machine called a reject machine, which is really cool. I mean, it's, we all should have one in our basement because you can call up any single pitcher in baseball. And this is a giant screen that's got a hole that moves around the screen. And let's say you want to hit against Zach Wheeler's fastball. Zach Wheeler appeals, life size Zach Wheeler appears on the screen and the hole moves to a certain spot and he, throw, he winds up and he throws the ball, and, it's a ball, and he, he throws the ball, it hits that hole precisely, and the ball comes out of the machine at, with exactly the spin rate and exactly the miles per hour for exactly, and then you can go to Aaron Nola's curveball, and Aaron Nola will pop up and the little thing will move. So there's lots of stuff like that, and, and there are people, I mean, we're absolutely on the cutting edge of that stuff, finally. It took us years to get caught up and then and it's some more, but all, that's so important in the game. I, don't, I, don't, I just don't know how you could long-term consistently be successful if you aren't kind of right, riding that wave at the right place. So, I, you know, I don't, and I can't tell you that the White Sox are or aren't. I just, uh, <laughs> I'm, just I'm just telling you that's where you, that's where you have to be. I mean, I mean, you look at the minor league, so, so, you look at the minor league staff, you compare it, I don't know, you guys, when I was in college, we had like one dean of students. There were like maybe four deans, there was a dean of students, there was a senior dean, and that was kind of it. You know, I don't think, I mean, my college has, I think, like 10 or 12 deans now, where there were like three or four. You know, the minor league staff we have today, it's just, it's twice as much, twice as many people that are there that were, you know. So that's where the money's going, and that's where you need to be kind of up with the times and preferably on the cutting edge of times. One more question? Yep, uh, we're there in the back. Thank you again for coming and speaking today. Um, I was curious how CBA negotiations affect kind of the individual team efforts. In what, in what I mean? Yeah, from a, a how you're spending money preparing for potential lockout, ticket revenue maybe potentially stopping if there was a lockout. Um, and, you know, like you said, COVID having a large-scale effect on the, the following years. Yeah, so, so you know, you, you can't really talk about that stuff among the owners because, frankly, it sounds a little bit like collusion. Um, <laughs> so, you know, you don't, you don't do that. I'll just tell you, from the Philly standpoint, we're, we're aware. I've been, I've been doing this for 30 years. I think the next one will be my – I think it will be my seventh – CBA, it's at least be my sixth. Um, so I've seen a lot. Um, and yeah, you do, you do kind of prepare for hibernation like bears. You, get, you try to save up and get fat and have something to live on during the lean times. Um, so, you know, we're doing, I know we're doing that. We actively work to do that. Um, but it's, it's, look, it's different for the Yankees than it is for the Phillies, and it's different for the Yankees and Phillies than it is for the Milwaukee Brewers or the Oakland A's. I mean, it's just, we're very different businesses. Um, but again, I'll go back to what I said. Part of, part of what I wanted to do with bringing the new investors in is bring in people who allow us to have more flexibility to deal with those kinds of issues that you, that you asked about. John, we're going to end on a good note. I'm going to ask you a question. Okay. 
Who's going to win the World Series next year? Uh, clearly we will. Okay, there you go. All right, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Ruby. <laughs>